so much. Really appreciate the hospitality. It's great to be uh, uh, at Boggy Creek Elementary School. Uh, we're here today to, to make, I think, an important announcement. As we see schools, uh, unfortunately, remain closed in key pockets of our country, uh, today's announcement doubles down on Florida's commitment to our students and to our parents. And the announcement is this. Schools will remain open for in-person instruction and we will continue to offer parents choices for the spring semester. And every parent in Florida can take that to the bank. Now I'm gonna let Commissioner Corcoran go into detail about his updated order, uh, but the long and short of it is it continues the requirement that districts offer in-person learning uh, and also contains the protections uh, of school district funding. Now there is one, I think, new addition, which I think is really important, and I think it was very well considered, and is this. Uh, parents must be notified if a student is struggling with virtual learning. Still providing the parent the option to, to do virtual learning if they want, but they need to be notified, and then the student must return to in-person instruction unless the parent affirmatively opts out and says they want to still remain virtual. And the reason why we're doing that is because the data and the evidence is overwhelmingly clear. The virtual learning is just not the same as being in person. And I think teachers in Florida have done a great job of trying to improvise and really particularly in those early days, the fact of the matter is the, the medium is just not the same as being in the classroom. So we wanted to uh, figure out a way to still offer the parents the choice, but to really put uh, the onus on the school districts to be monitoring this and when they see students fall behind, to really be affirmative and engaging with the parents. So I think it's a good model going forward. We're now 11, we really started looking at this, this uh, issue of coronavirus in January. Uh, so we've done 11 months of this and I, I would say that uh, closing schools due to coronavirus uh, is probably the biggest public health blunder in, in modern American history. Um, the fallout in communities that are still chafing under school closures, we have some of the biggest school districts in our country uh, that still do not have in-person instruction. Incidentally, of the top 10 school districts population-wise, five are in Florida, five, all five offer in-person instruction. Um, uh, but but the, the harm from this is going to reverberate in those communities for years and years to come. And the tragedy of all this is that the evidence has been remarkably clear since the spring uh, that closing schools offers virtually nothing in terms of virus mitigation, but imposes huge costs on our kids, on our parents, and on our society. Now we looked over, over the summer uh, as we were making the push, working with um, uh, both Commissioner Corcoran as well as a lot of our superintendents, uh, the experience, if you looked at the actual data and got away from the politics, was abundantly clear. Places like Sweden, Germany, Denmark, Switzerland, uh, all had positive experiences by keeping uh, kids in school. There's actually a study out of Iceland that got virtually no uh, coverage here in the United States that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They did genetic sequencing of their positive uh, PCR test samples and were able to determine which directions the infections were going. They identified zero infections going from a kid to an adult and that was one of the reasons why they thought it was important to have kids in school. The Prime Minister of Norway said that closing schools in the, in the spring was a mistake and that it may have actually increased viral spread in their community. And I think that since August, as states like Florida uh, reopened schools for in-person instruction, I think the U.S. experience has tracked with the European results. And I think tellingly, even as Europe has recently experienced a very, very sharp uh, outbreak in countries like France, uh, in Switzerland, in Belgium, uh, closing schools was simply off the table as a viable response. Some, like France, chose to shut down businesses. Others, like Switzerland, didn't do that. No one was talking about uh, closing schools. And I think that that uh, is reflective of what the, the, the evidence has shown us. Uh, so as we stand here today, uh, people who advocate closing schools 
for virus mitigation uh, are effectively today's flat earthers. They have no scientific or evidence support uh, for their position. Now here, when we were doing, uh, the commissioner did his uh, initial order over the summer, we were working with school districts, uh, we, we thought really two things. One, we had to provide students and parents the option to return to in-person instruction. We did, I'd say, as good a job as any state in the country with virtual learning um, in April and May. And we've put resources into it. It's something that we've, that we've focused on. Um, but there was no way you could look at the results. All you had to do was talk to a, a teacher. They all said the same thing, that it was not the same and that kids were falling behind. So we needed to give parents the ability to get their kids back in school. We also wanted to preserve their ability to remain virtual if that's what they were comfortable with. The other thing we wanted to do is to recognize that the school districts were facing um, you know, unique challenges in, in the environment that we were in. Um, and we wanted to provide them with flexibility. We wanted to provide protection uh, for their funding. And um, we wanted to make sure that we were giving them the tools they need uh, to be able uh, to succeed. And so uh, I think that uh, we've had a lot of people perform very well. No one can look at, it's not just Florida. Florida People have worked very hard here. They've worked hard other places. Um, you go back and look at that debate over the summer, some of the things that were said. I mean, I remember when Baker County was one of the first school districts to open. We had Good Morning America showing up in little old Baker County trying to say that, oh, these yokel Floridians are putting kids back into school. What's going to happen? Um, and so we, we kind of got beyond the politics of it. But that's really what it was. It was not an evidence-based debate. It was really about a, a political debate. We cut through that. We're able to get the kids um, uh, back in school. The vast, vast majority of parents have opted to put their kids in person. And I think the superintendents will tell you that tends to increase as people see the uh, success that's happened and really how, how much happier our kids are that they have the ability to do some of these things. I have parents, every time I'm out, someone will come up to me and say, when my daughter got back in school, things got so much better. And I think you see that all across the state. Um, and I also think that, the, obviously, the schooling and the academics is, is paramount. But we also had a debate over uh, the, the athletic season. There was a movement to try to shut down athletics for high school in the state of Florida, just like there was in other, um, other states. And uh, many other states still have no athletics, like California, some of these other ones. Uh, you had credentialed people saying there was going to be all these problems. Again, that's not what the evidence told us. Uh, so we thought it was really important to be able to provide um, those opportunities for our young people. And I've been proud to be able to attend several football games uh, this fall. So, uh, we attended a volleyball game um, uh, up in Hernando County, and uh, we tend to, uh, tend to do some more. My wife and I think it's very important. Brought my daughter to her first high school football game on Friday. She wants to go back. She really had fun. Everyone treated her very well. Um, but just things like that, if you were in some of these other states, you would be totally shut down from being able to participate in some of these things. And yet we see this has been good for the kids to be able to do it. We haven't seen um, any major problems. And so I want to thank Commissioner Corcoran for his work. I want to thank Superintendent Mike Grego, um, who uh, is familiar in, in this neck of the woods. He's doing a great job in Pinellas County. Superintendent Deborah Pace uh, has done a great job. You know, we work with them. I remember talking. You know, Mike was out uh, preparing. Uh, 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 Deborah was as well. Uh, they really worked hard, as well as all of our superintendents and administrators. So I want to thank them uh, for their work uh, over these last many months. I uh, also want to say a special thanks uh, to all of our teachers. Um, you know, you listen to some of the debate and there's certain organized interests that had certain perspectives on this, but the vast majority of teachers in the state of Florida wanted to get back in the classroom. I mean, they understood how important it was. They understood uh, what it meant for their students' future. And this is what drove them to do it. They're passionate about the kids' futures. And um, they've worked very hard. It was very difficult to do virtual and then have to come back in a, in a little bit different environment here. Uh, so I just want to say thanks. It's been uh, uh, very, very important to the well-being and the development of so many kids uh, throughout the state of Florida to have a, have a teacher that they look up to in the classroom over these many trying months. And, and finally, 
Uh, thanks to all the parents out there. It's not been easy uh, when you're having to juggle virtual learning uh, to get thrust into that. Um, you know, if you look back in, in March, the second week of March, you had people like Fauci telling people to go on a cruise. All of a sudden, the world changed like the next week. Um, so it was a pretty uh, dramatic shift. And, uh, and it's not easy. And um, you know, I really felt that, one, the schooling in person was good for its own sake for the kids. But I also understood, particularly uh, for single parents, a lot of single working moms that have to put food on the table, to be, have to do that and be uh, a teacher or be supervising the virtual was very, very difficult. And so uh, we understood uh, what, was, what was happening with a lot of the parents. We understood how trying it was. Um, and so we understood, well, this would be good for the students first and foremost. It would relieve um, a burden um, uh, on parents under very, very stressful times. But I just want to thank them for, for hanging in there. I know, I know it was difficult over those months in the spring. And, and we think that um, things are going um, in a much better direction now. So I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Corcoran come up, uh, go a little bit more in detail about the updated um, emergency order. Uh, but we really believe that, um, that this is something that's really, really important. And we just thought it was important, one, that the school districts kind of had their roadmap as they submit their plans. But also, as you see news of this area shutting down a school or this, that uh, parents in Florida would know, um, you know we're going to have our schools open. We, we understand it's very important. Thank you, Governor. Um, I want to echo just a, a couple of the points that the governor did say. And I think it's important because we're 100 days into uh, what Florida actually led the entire nation in getting our kids back into school and making sure that instruction was available and giving parents that choice. And it, you know, it, so it wasn't that far along ago where, uh, and I think Superintendent Grego um, said it best in a, in a letter, and that is uh, we should all be thankful for the sure, strong, and fact-driven leadership uh, from Governor DeSantis. Uh, you have other governors out there who spend you know, pandemic time writing books. And we have one, thank you, Lee, that, that is reading and studying the data and looking at what's happening in other countries. Um, and it's so important as that is a backdrop because education, you look around you know, this elementary school and you see all the quotes, um, but education is distinctly that thing that makes us human beings. Um, and it is that thing that gives us dignity. Um, and that's such a powerful concept and word. And if you're going to take that and rob that from our school children, um, that threshold has to be really, really high. And it has to be 100% certain. And we had none of that going back into the throes of the summer. And when the governor announced we're going to have face-to-face -face instruction, we're going to open schools, and there's just this litany of outcry, um, unscientific, non-fact-driven, uh, not even taking the time to read the research that was out there, the studies that the governor has quoted, whether it's Iceland or other ones. And now we move forward 100 days, and now the studies are coming out. Everyone's like, OK, um, yep, you know, even these national you know, epidemiological experts are you know, back 120 days ago, it's too soon to open schools. It'll cause community spread. And now they're saying, open the schools, close everything else. Um, and how can you be respected, in a sense, when you're making opinions that are 180 degrees different from what you said just a, you know, days earlier? And so to be able to push through that and push through the, the, the rhetoric of, of we were leading kids into you know, some sort of death march, and when the reality is the opposite was true. And now you have a study, Jama just wrote about it, where in, this is an elementary school. So if you take elementary students in the nation, 24, give or take, million students. Now they're saying, and this was schools only being closed for about 50 some days or 11 weeks, and they're saying that's five and a half days of life that could have been lost from those 56, uh, 50, uh, 50 days. Loss of life, five, point, five and a half million days of life just for elementary school kids. And yet, just willy-nilly, people are saying they shut down the schools. And yet, here in Florida, um, thanks to the governor, um, we, set, we had the governor. Um, he had our office. He had his own staff digging through every single study, every single research, working in partnership and collaboration every step of the way with our superintendents. And, and we had the uh, opening in the fall, supported by all 67 superintendents. Um, only one entity out there sued us, and that entity today, 100 days later, is begging us to continue to do what we did so well. 
Um, I just say that as a backdrop because it's important that when you're dealing with children's lives, if you're dealing with human beings being who they are and you're dealing with dignity, you should not just emotionally, willy-nilly, without scientific, scientific evidence, put them in harm's way, which was what was happening absent a governor who was willing to stand in the gap. Um, and I think that needs to be said. I also want to, before I get a little bit into the order, um, the Association of Superintendents, uh, Kurt Browning and now Mike Grego, uh, Deborah Pace, obviously, uh, I, there has been very few days I could think of where we have not, our offices, staffs, been in constant communication. Um, what you're seeing in this order today, um, as much as I'd like to say it was, uh, you know, something that we came up with, or our staff came up with, it was working in collaboration with them, but uh, these are their ideas because they're on the ground and they're seeing what's happening with students. They're seeing who's, who's in jeopardy, who's in this different mode. Um, and so all of these changes that we've made were really recommendations um, with a heartfelt thank you um, to the Association of Superintendents because um, these are their ideas on the ground, seeing, talking to their teachers, talking to their parents. This is how we can improve the executive or, uh, emergency order. And so that, those are the improvements. But basically, it's, uh, we, again, as the governor said, we have the full parental choice, uh, continue to maintain all of those things in the initial emergency order of schools have to be open, face-to-face -face instruction has to be offered, uh, continue with the progress monitoring so that we can make sure that we're not losing these children. Um, and if we are losing them, new additions, thanks to the superintendents, is, as the governor said, if you're a parent and you're in a mode and the districts are saying to you that your child's not doing well in that mode, then we want you to move them out of that mode into another mode. And if the parent, for what, it, maybe they have health concerns or reasons, um, but as you heard from the superintendents, the growth in our enrollment in face-to-face -face instruction every day grows. Um, and as a state, this is a, an astounding set, we're up, uh, give or take 17,000 students year over year, more students in our schools than in the previous year, because we even have parents who have dual residences and now they've made Florida their home because our schools are open and they have that face-to-face -face opportunity. And so we're seeing that growth, um, but when we see that that mode's not working for that child and that parent, we want them to move into a different mode or if that parent, as the governor said, um, says no, I, I'm gonna keep them in that mode, then we do something even more for all of those kids that we're looking at, and we're seeing at risk, the superintendents, we're gonna do massive interventions. And we're gonna, and, and, and in the order we talk about, you know, who's, who is it that needs the interventions, where, when, how are you gonna do it, all of that. They're gonna submit plans to us. Um, in fact, uh, Superintendent Pace has already given um, some great ideas in her plan that she's uh, shared with the district that we love um, and, and tweak here and there. But if you have these kids in virtual, trying to get them more and more into that face-to-face -face instruction because we know it works. And then we have the financial stability. If you are a growth county, 24 of our counties had growth in student population. And so we reward them with full funding. And, and for the districts that were not having growth or below growth, what we did was we took everybody, put them into the pool, and spread, a, spread that loss among everybody. I think the total is like 17 million among all the counties, um, which is staggering uh, considering what it could have been. And, and the governor was very gracious. Working with the superintendents, we had excess funds from a turnaround that were unspent. That was poured in to mitigate. Um, some of the losses to the folks below the line. So it's a, a total of 17 million, but we still have, I want to say, almost 500 million in unspent CARES funds for the districts um, that they're going to be able to plug those holes. So it's going to be a complete victory across the board for all 67 counties. And, uh, and when you think, if we didn't make these changes, if we just went back to the statute as it existed, there could be $3 billion worth of losses for the districts. If we said that all of those folks were just virtual and not in these innovative distance plans, it was almost a billion dollars worth of losses. So to be able to have these innovations, have these improvements, and only have um, $17 million uh, you know, spread among the districts, but having that CARES money to backfill it, um, is it just a great opportunity for us to continue to work with our parents, work with our teachers, uh, work with our, our, our administrators and the whole ch uh, school family to, again, be number one in the nation in the delivery of education for our school children because it is that, you know, all the great philosophers would say, you know, show me, uh, you want to know what your future looks like as a state? You want to know what your future looks like as a country? Show me how you're educating your youth and I will tell you the future. Well, in Florida, thanks to the great leadership of Governor Sanders, we are educating our youth better than any other state and that's a great day. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of you guys for your participation and Superintendent Pace. 
Thank you. Thank you, Governor DeSantis. Thank you, Commissioner Corcoran, for your, for your amazing strong leadership and your advocacy for students and families and teachers and principals all across the state, particularly here in the school district of Osceola County. Um, not only have you studied the science, but you've listened to the concerns that we, we brought to you, the ideas that we shared about how we can make learning better for the kids here in the state of Florida. We do know that learning happens best in a classroom with a caring teacher surrounded by their peers, but we also know that that's not the right option for some of our families, some students who've been successful in the digital learning world. So we're very, very appreciative of being able to continue to offer that option, to be able to rest at night with a little bit more uh, fiscal stabil stability than we otherwise would have had. And, and again, we just greatly appreciate your leadership, your advocacy, your passion for making learning a priority here in the state of Florida. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, for being here, Governor DeSantis and Commissioner Corcoran, and for this announcement, the very important announcement. Um, as president of the Superintendents Association, I can say to you that I am thrilled that the Commissioner of Education and the Governor reaches out to each of us as an association uh, to FADS and ask our opinion. And that's not always been the case. And so I, I just want to publicly say thank you. These are difficult times. These are unprecedented times. And the fact that we have leaders who reach out to ask about, as the Commissioner has said, what is it like on the front line and what and, what and how can we help you means all the difference in the world, makes all the difference in the world. And it will get us through the, these times. But I also want to thank specifically the Governor uh, for championing pump public education. And that is, as you'll see in the um, emergency order, um, that the opportunities for families has been mentioned many a times to have choices. Families who are desperate in the needs of bringing and returning their students back to our schools and also families with conditions that have had to stay out and, and work remotely. I want to say thank you because we've led as a state with safety and, and, for, and we've led with safety foremost to our students and to our faculties, to our teachers, to our parents and, and others. We've listened to them. I also want to say thank you for allowing, it's been said uh, several times, but you'll see the importance of this as uh, districts will, the fiscal stability of our districts. At a time in this country where very little is fiscally stable, um, our governor and our state is providing stability to our school districts. Uh, we serve just under 3 million pre-K through 12 students, and this is critical in, in this time. Thank you for also providing the, the, the schools and appropriately funding those districts that have had growth, and also by, by uh, prorating these, the districts that uh, need to be prorated by. And I can tell you, as a district that would have been uh, hit very heavily in, in a decrease in enrollment, the proration uh, share of this is minuscule, very small to do that. And with the CARES Act, as the Commissioner mentioned, is, is truly a win-win situation for us. Perhaps one of the most important aspects of the uh, order, though, is the accountability section for the academic achievement of our students. And that is we need to be brutally honest, caring, loving, uh, nurturing, compassionate with our parents and our students, but we need to be honest with how their, st how their student, how their scholars are doing. And if they're not doing well, we need to establish an educational plan for each and every student. And we need to have that as more of a contract, as you'll see in this order. And I want to end as uh, president of the FADS and, and Association by, by thanking the governor, because I think through this pandemic, we've lost sight that we have had a, a historic increase in teacher salaries. This past year, uh, this past session, $500 million went to um, starting teacher salaries at a time where teachers really truly need it and this profession need it, needs it to, to boost the importance of teacher education and to boost the importance of young people to go into this profession. And so it is also a time where I think everyone on, on, in this state would have understood our governor by backing up and maybe reestablishing uh, re different priorities, but he didn't. And for that and for the profession, I certainly truly want to say thank you on behalf of all of our, of our teachers and our districts and our superintendents. Thank you so much for your leadership. Well, it seems like um, 
A long time ago, we were fighting for that teacher pay increase. I mean, lots happened since then, but it, it was something that we thought was important. I know Richard was really involved in saying, okay, what do we need to do uh, to, well, obviously you want to reward great teachers, but you also want to, you know, get people to come into teaching uh, that may have other options. And, um, and not that it's all about money, but it certainly helps. And so we're, what, fifth in the country now for average minimum salary, uh, which uh, I think is important. And so we were able to, navigate a very difficult budget uh, situation. I did a record vetoes of a billion dollars, but um, I went into it saying we were going to preserve the gains that, that we made because it really was a historic uh, step forward and, uh, and we were able to do that. And so we're, we're happy that we were able to do it. Uh, we obviously are going to want to preserve it in this legislative session. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll see these budget numbers come in and, and not. I think it's, uh, we've done better uh, each and every month than was forecasted over the last four or five months. And I think we'll continue to see that. So uh, we want to keep that, keep that momentum going. But again, thanks to everyone who's working uh, in our school system systems, our school districts, uh, uh, the other schools that we have, uh, thanks to the teachers and thanks to those parents who uh, have, had, uh, have had to endure a lot. So I really think that you know, we've, we've done, it, done it the right way. We're going to continue doing it with some, some minor adjustments that will, I think, help ensure more accountability. And uh, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, the uh, strong uh, finish for this fall semester and then a very good spring semester. So um, it's, uh, it's good that our parents and students have these opportunities here. With that, I'm happy to take some questions. So I mean, a couple of things. One, we've been doing a, a lot of work on preparing for the vaccine. So um, not thanks the week before Thanksgiving, I went up to Washington, D.C. I think I'm the only governor that's done this in the country. Met with members of Operation Warp Speed. I met with the Secretary of HHS, CDC Director, other people um, at HHS uh, to make sure that obviously we want these effective vaccines approved, but they need to be distributed efficiently and we need to be able to, to apply those. Um, and, and for me, you know, we're not going to have unlimited the first month. I think we pretty much will have one for every American within a few months, though. If the J&J &J vaccine, see the Pfizer and the Moderna, you need a booster, so you need two shots. And I just think Floridians should understand that, that it was these vac initial vaccines roll out. If you're in kind of in those target groups that we're going to try to get right off the bat, you, know, you will need to get a booster. But I think as we get into the new year, if the J&J &J vaccine proves to, uh, uh, ends up being effective, which I think it will be, that's one shot. And so you're going to be able to get that widely distributed. So we've been working very hard on that. The long-term care facilities, I think, are, are a big priority because that's where 40% of the mortality nationwide has occurred for residents of long-term care facilities because they're in congregate settings where the virus can spread more if it gets in. And they're obviously usually have two, three, four comorbidities and advanced age. So we've been working with uh, CVS and Walgreens who have contracts with the federal government for them to go in and do this. Now, we obviously are going to decide where the vaccine's initial allotment goes, but we really believe that that's very, very important. So we've been working very, very hard on that, and I think it's a game changer. Uh, we could potentially have, out of 40 million doses by the end of the month, that's 20 million people, Florida share would be at least a million, maybe as much as two million uh, that we'll be able to do. And if you're applying that on key areas, that's going to make a big, big difference. So that has really been a big priority. We're working very hard on that uh, from um, you know middle of the, just November all the way until the present. We're going to keep doing it. I may go back to D.C. here in the next couple of days. Um, we'll see. Now, in terms of the cases, what was it? Seven-day average, we're 44th in the country. So yes, we've seen cases increase. But look at all the other states that have seen it increase way, way more. And so I hear people say, oh, well, Florida is open and they're having increased cases. Well, okay, the states that are locked down are increasing twice the rate we are. If you look at the per capita cases in a lot of these states that have closed schools, businesses shuttered, some of them even post stay-at-home orders um, there, you see huge increase 
um, in these cases. And so uh, we knew, and I mean, I think I said um, months ago, of course, as the seasons change, we're in respiratory season, uh, you're seeing it go. Uh, but I would say Florida is uh, right now in, in, our, in our hospitals, we have about 4,000 patients who are being treated for COVID who are COVID positive. At the summer, we were at 10, almost 10,000 uh, COVID positive patients. If you look at the per capita hospitalizations, we're not even close to the, to the, to the top of the stuff. So I just think people should put it in perspective. You know, what I, what I want to do is really work on this vaccine. I think personal mitigation that individuals have done um, have been effective. So people that are higher risk, you know, make choices about avoiding those situations that may be more conducive to viral spread, particularly if you're in a close uh, contact indoors with poor ventilation. Um, but I can tell you these business closures have not worked to arrest the spread of the virus. If it was, you would not see what's going on in many of these other states of the country. So you know, we really believe you know, we're gonna continue to uh, protect our most vulnerable. I just earmarked another half a million tests uh, so that every visitor of a long-term care facility, all the contractors, staff, everyone has the ability, uh, they can test to make sure because if we can get through the next few weeks without seeing more outbreaks in these facilities, we're going to be basically where we need to be because that first dose, while it's not protective forever, it does, we think, offer some protection. So we think in a couple of weeks, if we have shots going in, that's going to offer protection for vulnerable people. They still need the booster to have the, the immunity la be long lasting. Uh, but that's something that's very, very positive. So we really want to focus on that. Uh, we also want to focus on continuing to work with our hospitals to make sure they have capacity. They have abundant capacity. If you look, influenza has dropped off the map. You're not seeing influenza hospitalizations. We would start to see that now because we're in the respiratory virus season. You're just not seeing it. If you look at the ED visits overall, they're down year over year from where, where they were uh, for all causes. If you look at the hospital availability, I think this morning census I looked, I think there's between 16 and 17,000 empty beds. And so their census is lower than it was. There's abundant capacity. That's obviously been an important thing. Remember, the 15 days to slow the spread, no one thought you could eliminate the virus. No one thought there'd be zero cases. It was don't let hospitals be overcrowded. And then that obviously causes a lot of problems. So we're in really good shape there. Um, we've helped uh, get more therapeutics to the hospitals. I mean, earlier it was the convalescent plaza, plasma and the remdesivir, which, you know, I think is, ex excuse me. Excuse me, I'm, I'm talking about what we're doing. Um, and um, so, so that, you know, was a, how much that affected, I'm not sure. We have two emergency use authorizations for uh, monoclonal antibodies that have happened over the last couple of weeks. You have the Eli Lilly monoclonal, and then you have the Regeneron monoclonal. So Florida hospitals are getting about 6,000 a week between the two of them. So those are really for people who are higher risk, 65 and up or have two serious comorbidities if they are infected and they present prior to really needing to be in like intensive care it's a one hour iv treatment uh, we think it's reducing hospital admissions i think we're going to need a couple more weeks to really um, understand that uh, but that was one of the reasons i went to dc to make sure that we got all the monoclonals to all our hospitals and so they have the eli Lilly. we think most of them have regeneron now um, and then we also have the um, drug that was used for rheumatoid arthritis that was given an EUA to be used for hospitalized patients. That is being distributed by Eli Lilly as well. Um, so that's going to continue to be something uh, that we're focused on. But um, in terms of no lockdowns, um, no fines, no school closures, no one's losing their job because of a government dictate, nobody's losing their livelihood or their business. That is totally off the table. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me? Virtual class. Virtual class, yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. So look, so the message is schools are open. If you see someplace in California or Illinois or New York closing schools, just parents need to have peace of mind. We're going to be here for you in Florida. We are not going to abandon your child. We're not going to abandon you. And these school districts are not going to, are not going to do that. We are still offering 
parents to make a choice. If they choose to do virtual, then they have the ability to opt for that. Um, and, and look, there's different reasons why you would do it. Uh, personally, um, you know, I, I, I think I think the studies have shown that a school-aged kid is more likely to get infected if they're not in school than if they're in school. I think that's what the data shows. But we still want, we understand it's a tough time. Parents have different views on it, so we do it. But I think adding this wrinkle that says if somebody's in virtual and they're failing and they're falling behind, school, their school's got to reach out to that parent, lay it on the line for them and just say, here's what's happening. This is not good. Um, you need to send your kid back, or you have to affirmatively say you want to remain virtual. And look, if a parent makes that decision, they make the decision. But we just want to make sure that parents understand the progress is not going to be the same uh, in 90% of the cases between virtual and uh, between in-person instruction. And so, and, and look, the acad and we measure the, try to measure the academic progress, and, and I think everyone would admit it's fallen behind. But you know, also just being a kid and being able to see your friends. Um, and that's really been one of the biggest things about how happy a lot of the kids were to be back, uh, to be able to have some semblance uh, of normalcy where they're not always isolated. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we have uh, virtual education, we have distance learning, which is the innovative options, and then you have the regular face-to-face -face instruction. And so it's completely all the exact same as the, the first semester for the districts with the one little is that we wanted to fund those 24 districts that had growth because clearly they're doing something right. I, we, you know, whether it's, you know, communication, whether it's, you know, uh, giving uh, confidence about what they're doing in terms of um, COVID all of those things, but it led to growth, and so we want to fully fund those. So that led to the 17 million for everyone below the line, all of them contributing in their pro rata share. Um, and so there's a, it's a de minimis amount, as, as you heard from the superintendents, easily overcome by the, the uh, ESSER funds that we got as a result of the CARES package. And so, yeah, I think uh, it's, 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 apart from that little nuance, it's the exact same as in the fall. Growth meaning kids who came back face-to-face. Additional growth over your count. So if you said we we're going to have 5,000 students and you have seven, we funded you for those extra 2,000 children. My second question <clears> too <throat> is when you say massive interventions for parents, when they hear that, what does that mean? And could parents or students find repercussions if they decide, I know my student's struggling, but I do not want to send them back? No, they have the, the governor has been very clear. They have that choice. We've uh, from day one, he has been completely um, adamant that we we're going to have full parental choice, and we've maintained that full parental choice. What from talking with the superintendents and them working with the parents, this is you know their frontline innovations, which we think are fantastic at the department, and that is if you have that parent and their child is not doing well. Um, and we're going to leave it to the districts. They're going to submit by December 15th their plans. We'll look at them. But in those plans, we're saying, you know, who are, you, who, who is, who are we talking about? What kind of interventions are you going to do? When are you going to do those interventions? Are you going to continue those interventions into the summer? All of those things um, are going to be taken in, looked at. And you're going to have all of these great superintendents pulling from each other's great plans and saying, I like what, you know, Deborah did there. I like what Mike did that. And so we know by ha having that discipline to go through that exercise of getting those interventions. Our goal is, um, I think Deborah said a year and a half of learning is, is, is the goal here. Um, we're not going to lose a child. We, we, you know, we know from early prognostications from our, our last semester emergency order, looking at the trends and some of the progress monitoring, we're seeing deeper um, losses in math than in, than in uh, ELA. Um, but we're going to get there. We're going to catch them up. But the way you do it is you stay on top. You, you know, in, in the CARES package, we sent down money to the districts to have a sort of the a progress monitoring guru who's constantly tracking that data, saying, okay, hey, this third grade class, we, we've got to pull up here. We've got to do this. And, and we're staying on top of it day by day, week by week, um, so that when we get to that end of the year, um, hopefully we've caught them up. Hopefully we don't have losses. And if we do, we'll take it into the summer with those interventions. 
No, this, this, the districts are going to submit plans. They're all they're going to submit plans to us. Uh, we're evaluating. We'll evaluate them in turn. You know, the reading content, the math content, uh, what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, but but already we've seen. I mean, we've had these conversations with the with the superintendents going six weeks. I mean, ever since the first emergency order, we've been talking. Okay, what what are you seeing? What are the trends? And so we have, um, as we know, the best superintendents in the in the country. And just as we did in the fall, we're, we're, I, we're, I think we're going to see fantastic. Um, strategies and interventions by the district and we're going to uh, make sure those best practices are spread around among everybody and, and get those kids to where they need to be. No, and I, I think that um, it's 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 broader than what you what you've stated. I think what they've said is even absent that schools are a safer place. That, that's where a child. Same with sports. The concept of shutting down sports. So we're going to say I have six children. All of my kids are back in public school, and I can tell you when they're not in public school. As much as I'd like to think I'm a, a decent parent, they're down the street playing flag football with each other. They're at the basketball court playing without an adult, without instruction, without discipline without all those things that happen every day in a school, absent interventions with COVID. But we've done a great job of, of, of getting money to the districts for, for COVID-related expenses, of working with the districts and, and allowing that flexibility for them to work with what works best for them. But, but I think the medical studies are pretty clear, and we'll be glad to share them with you. You know, uh, Mike is in Pinellas. Uh, he's got John Hopkins Children's Hospital. They've testified before their board that, hey, you know what we're seeing now 100 days in? We're pretty sure schools are the safest place for kids to be. Regardless, they're the safest place for kids and to I, be. And I think that's true regardless of policy. We, we don't mandate or not mandate, but you know, we have uh, a charter schools, private schools, particularly for the young kids. They don't do the distancing because it's just, you know, there's no, and there's no difference in outcome um, on it. And so I think, I think what Richard says is right. You know, schools are just, in fact, a safe place to be for these kids with this particular pathogen. It's, you know, an in influenza, you would see a lot of it being passed around with kids. You don't do it with, uh, with corona, um, and that's it. Yes, ma'am? Uh, so, I know you said no lockdowns, no school closures, that's off the table. Have you considered the lockdowns that are in place now for the school district and for Minnesota? How has that worked out in the states that have done it? Has that stopped an outbreak in Minnesota, Illinois, Michigan? What about New Jersey? What about all these states where you have explosion in cases? So, I mean, at some point, does the observed experience matter? I'm opposed to mandates, period. I don't think they work. People in Florida wear them when you go out. I mean, they don't have to be uh, strung up by a bayonet to do it. Fining people is, I think, totally overboard. But at some point, you have to look at the observed experience about what's happening. And I think, you know, respectfully, there's, there's narratives that, like, lockdowns work. And they don't. If you look at the evidence, business closures, all this stuff, look at what just happened in Europe. France locked down, Switzerland didn't. Same viral curve, literally no difference. So you focus on protecting vulnerable people. Uh, you provide the resources to our medical and hospitals as they need it, um, but you don't shut down people because the effects of that are profound and these are things that are just now going to, I mean, we're only scratching the surface when you look at everything from mental health, drug abuse, all these other things. They're just really, really harmful. Um, but I think it's pretty clear, because remember, over the summer, the narrative was, oh, the Sun Belt, you know, they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing, all this other stuff. The North had very little. Now, that was not because of their policies. People tried to say that. It was because they have a different uh, respiratory virus season. So it receded. It receded in Europe. Remember, in July, people were saying Europe did it right. And then they had a big resurgence. Um, and you've seen these resurgences in all these places that have had really restrictive policies. And so my, my view would be like, okay, would you rather be 44th in cases and be open like Florida is? Or would you rather be in the top 10 in cases and be locked down and have continual lockdowns far into the future. And that's another thing. The, lo the lie of the lockdown was if you just lock down, then you can, get, you, can, you can beat the virus. Well, why are people having the lockdown two or three times then? If lockdowns are so effective, why is that? And here's what really irks me about it. Uh, the costs of the lockdowns are borne by working class people. 
the benefit, if you say it, of the, are the Zoom class, the upper, upper income people who can work from home. Not everyone can do that. People have to go out. And so that one, that's what ends up happening. And, um, and I think you can't look at what's happened over the last several months um, in Europe and in the United States and, and say that that is, a, that is a viable path forward. The damage is immense. And I think you have to search long and hard to see really true uh, benefits, um, you know, that you're, uh, for, for any of this stuff. So um, targeted approach, I think, is better. That, quite frankly, was what pandemic preparedness had always said. No one advocated society-wide lockdowns before March, never. Um, and so I think, uh, I think going forward the way Florida has, look, here's, here's what I'd say. People vote with their feet. People are coming here at a higher clip than they were a year ago. And I think part of the reason is, um, you know, we have schools open, we have people employed. We obviously got a lot more work to do on that, um, but we really want to have a healthy uh, and, and stable society, and that's what we've worked hard to do. One more. Yeah, to your point on employment, you know, our theme parks are about to lay out tens of thousands of people here. Mostly in California, though. Yeah, and, and a lot here, too, as well. Well, right, but the bulk of it is because California will not let the theme parks operate. Yeah, so, yes, but is there any talk of well, yeah, look, I think the federal, I think they should have done a relief package months ago. Um, you know, the reason why a lot of people are unemployed is because of federal policies with the 15 days to slow the spread. The theme parks were never shut down by the state of Florida. They did it because of what these federal experts were saying to do. Um, so I think it really, that, that unemployment is really on the federal government because I think they're the ones that cause it. But, um, and so they should do relief. Uh, hopefully they'll do it, you know, over the next month or two. Um, I think it is needed. I think a lot of people have been treated poorly, um, you know, in this with some of the way the economies work. But I will say one thing that will help, well, two things I would say. One, everyone now acknowledges the theme parks have not led to any type of major outbreaks. Now, I said that from the beginning. Remember when Disney reopened? People were saying they were carping. Oh, my goodness. Um, but we knew because of the way it's done, they had precautions and all that. It's outdoors, all these other things. And I think Disney, SeaWorld, Universal, all those have done very well. Um, and yet, you know, in California, they're totally shut down. They, they have no path to reopen. Who knows when it will? And here's what I think should concern Americans. It started 15 days to slow the spread to save hospitals. Then it somehow graduated. Well, we just can't have any cases, which quite frankly is not possible with policy, then it was like, well, just shut down everything until there's a vaccine. Now that there's a vaccine on the rise, you say people, even with the vaccine, social distance until 2022. No way. Don't, that, is, that is just totally overboard. But it just shows you how the goalposts have moved. And I think innocent people have been caught up in this. One of the things we can do to help Central Florida is, and I think the president wants to do this, let's get travel from Brazil uh, back. Let's get uh, travel from the European countries back. You know, the travel restrictions at the front end of a pandemic, I think, made sense. I advocated in January for the China restrictions. Now, in fact, people had already spread it from China by January. And so it was a little, I think it, had, I think it was positive, but I don't think it was as good. We did some stuff with New York because they were spreading it around the country. But at this point, it's an endemic virus. To have these types of travel restrictions is not getting you any benefit. And I think it's causing um, a lot of people a lot of harm. So yes, let's hope to do some uh, federal uh, relief. I think that that's good. We obviously have worked to put people back to work, let people earn a living, uh, protect their livelihoods, uh, which is important. But um, you know, we're not immune from everything that goes on um, in the rest of the rest of the world and the rest of the country, particularly when you have these destinations uh, like that. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, the White House COVID uh, report that, you, as you know, it comes out every week. Specifically, each state, your office gets it, put suggestions, warnings in some cases. Uh, generally, it comes out on the weekend. We've been trying to get it less than a week after it's been put out. The delay is always at least a week sometimes at the vascular office. Why the delay? Did you know? Did we get it sooner than that? No, and, and quite frankly, I mean, I think that if you look at some of the recommendations, I mean, they did not want schools open. Um, 
They were not supportive of schools. You go back six months, some of those task force folks were saying, oh, we don't know. We did know. We knew six months ago, based on the observed experience and the data and evidence out of Europe, that schools were safe. And yet, you had these things say, well, if you're, I mean, just look at New York. If your positivity is above whatever more, uh, arbitrary thing, you have to close the school. Really? You're going to shut kids out of an education for a, 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 literally a metric that's pulled out of somebody's hat. There's no basis for, for any of that. And so, you know, some of that stuff, I think, was, was problematic uh, from, from my perspective um, with the schools. And I think that had we had a unified message as a country uh, six months ago, I don't think there'd be a single school district that would be closed in this country right now. But I think when you indulge in, oh, this is potentially very dangerous, when you know that the evidence suggests otherwise, I think that gave license to a lot of these places uh, to close um, with really no end in sight. I mean, there may be some of these school districts certainly are going to be closed, again, not Florida, certainly until January, but they're probably just going to extend it through the whole school year. So that'll be a year and a quarter of no in-person instruction in some of these places. That's going to have a huge, hugely negative impact on, on millions and millions of families and millions and millions of students. And look, I'm just glad that we have folks here who rolled up their sleeves, put the interests of the kids and the families first. And uh, I think that this, uh, this uh, emergency order uh, continues uh, with the successful model. I think it builds upon it. And we look forward to seeing uh, having a great spring semester for everybody. Thanks.